Charlie, it's very simple. No bullshit news. Like most of your stories, it's false. No bullshit news. Stop with the media bullying. Charlie? No bullshit news. Hot dog. No, sh no, no shame in my game. Wait, hey, hey, look at me once. You look at me twice. Look at me again and is it gonna be a fight? We're gonna rock this town. We're gonna rip this place apart. Welcome back. What's up, Bobby? All right, we are back. We episode are. four. Episode four. The last one was just psycho, wasn't it? Oh my God, off the chain. Well, off some, the chain. sometimes when you got a judge going berserk, you let the judge go berserk. I suspect we'll be hearing more from her and about her in the coming weeks. You know what I mean? I do. I'm not I sure do. what's happening with that career. But anyway, today uh, we got a lot of stuff to to, to get to. Uh, a lot of we got Joe Palooza. Intern Joe uh, really, really cuts his teeth. He, uh, uh, we sent him out to play dead on the streets of Detroit to see if anybody help him. Being, <laughs> being the second most violent city in America, uh, what kind of heart does the city have? Was that a hard play for him, playing dead? It kind of was, bro. <laughs> he wasn't sure how to. He was moaning. I said, Joe, you, you, you can't moan and talk to yourself and be dead at the and, same and time. Be dead, yeah, it no. looks a little suspicious, you know. <laughs> um, also, Joe Corners embattled uh, city councilman Gabe Leland, the, the guy under the FBI microscope. Joe, with the exclusive interview of uh, Gabe Leland. And showing some reporter cred. He, yeah, yeah, he, he, he asked him the tough questions. The ongoing education of intern Joe, showing you, once again, that anybody with a heart, some guts, and curiosity can be a reporter, no matter how shabby you might look. Because <laughs> <laughs> the shirt this week had... Uh, dog hair and, and uh, I look like ho ho stains. Oh jeez! But uh, you know, Joe's my boy, man. Joe's a hard worker. Joe's going places. Joe is going places. And he's, also, he's a hard worker. We're gonna bring you, you know, uh, the bullshit news. The uh, Detroit is now the second most violent city in America, not the first. But what you've been? Yay! We're there winning, winning. Well, but what you were fa failed to be told was violent crime has gone up in Detroit every year for the last four years. So that's nothing to clap about. All right, that's just rankings. But I'm really pleased, really happy to have in studio right now a uh, couple of the producers from Crime Town. Crime Town, if you don't know it, uh, last year was a really popular... Uh, powerful. Really powerful uh, a podcast, a true crime series from Providence, Rhode Island, Mob Town, USA, with... Uh, Buddy Cianci, the well, and, and, and just let me stop you there for a second because I, I like it. Who would have thought Providence, Rhode Island, was a mafia town? I mean, I was like Rhode Island. I mean, that's where me, myself, and Irene took place. Like, who would have thought that Providence, Rhode Island, was the mob town? But it was. You guys did a great job. I mean, it's super, super compelling. Yeah, in studios, uh, the producer John White and uh, Rob Zipko. Thanks for coming in, guys. It's uh, really an honor. Well, thanks for having us, Charlie. And to introduce this properly, season two, they've come to Detroit. Yes, come sir. to Detroit, Michigan. So before we get into it, uh, hey, Rob, did you, did you produce this trailer? Oh, it was a team effort, but I was cutting it up in Pro Tools. Man, yeah. this thing's bad at the bone. It's, it's cool, and uh, I just want to play the whole thing. So Bob, why don't we just roll that and let everybody get a little... I'm little... jealous of them having these production studs on staff for this stuff. We need, we need some uh, new people on our podcast. <laughs> Not to mention 30 million downloads. You are about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. It is a story of a city seeking new horizons in a resolute contest with great challenges. That city is Detroit. One, two, three, now! Wow! That's hot. We're bankrupt. The children's schools suck. There's no work here. And all the dudes that are responsible for this probably had steak in Bordeaux for lunch. I think that was me, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Welcome to Crime Town, produced in partnership with Gimlet Media. I'm Mark Smerling. Each season, we examine crime and corruption in a different city. And this season, we're heading to Detroit. Law and order have broken down in Detroit, Michigan. Black people learn how to talk back to white people in Detroit and not be afraid. Nice. 
you've probably heard that Detroit has a lot of crime. So we're going to bring you stories from the people who've actually lived it. This city teach you one thing for sure. You always need a hustle. If you don't, it's going to blow up in your fucking face. He throws a, a bag on the table just like that. I say, what's that, sugar, flour? He say, no, that's dope. Just like last season, you'll hear from the criminals. Blue! Shot me right through the head, came out right here. Just missed my brain. And the cops. Nobody was summarily executed, because that's something you couldn't justify. <laughs> and some unsung heroes. I don't half-step nothing. When I tell you I'm going to get you, <laughs> take it to the bank. You lie under oath, you go to jail. He says, nope, God is on my side. I said, Mr. Mayor, I do not often speak for God, but God is not on your side. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to just talk, because that's what I do best. Finally, we'll tell you about a mayor who promised to turn the city around, Kwame Kilpatrick. It's time for all of us to rise up and begin our future right here, right now. So how did that lead us to jail? Well. <laughs> $500 spa visits. Rockstar style entourages. A stripper who later wound up dead. I saw people walking around with shirts that said, put Kwame in jail. You would not have seen a black person with that shirt on. In a city divided by race, things aren't always black and white. All the crackers and all the racists used him to justify their own prejudices. So he used the race card as a shield. That was Elric. Vindication. That's what we seek. Total vindication for Kwame Malik Kilpatrick. And we'll be hearing straight from the source. This call is from Kwame Kilpatrick. An inmate at a federal prison to accept dial five now. Hey, Kwame. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm okay, man. I'm so glad you called. I was getting a little worried, but uh, I figured you'd pull through. Crime Town Season 2, coming October 1st, exclusively on Spotify. Wow. wow. Holy shit, I can't wait for that. <laughs> yeah. well, I love yeah. the production, and they used a song from the punk band Death, which was a mid-70s, three black brothers. There's a documentary on them, which is fantastic. Nice job. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Sweet. Yeah, thank you. Did your it's work. It's to cut with that song. That Death song's amazing. Yeah. How'd you find it? Uh, we were looking for music uh, to go along with some of our early cuts, and, and Death you know, jumped out at us and said, take us. A lot of us had seen the documentary, and we were pretty familiar with Death, so yeah. we were kind of excited about using that. Uh, I, man, there's a million places to go. I mean, I, I, I could jump in with Kwame first, but I'm not gonna. Let's just let that one. Oh, come on! <laughs> Wait, I, I gotta go. Like, like, why Detroit? Why did you pick here? Like Bob was saying, like, Providence is freaky, you don't know about it, and it's like mob town, mob capital. You'd never expect it, right? Why Detroit? I mean, I think, you know, Detroit's been in the news, you know, for centuries. But, you know, recently there's been, you know, news of its decline. And, you know, you have pictures of sort of ruined porn. But you also have these articles about how there's this renaissance here and, you know, why it's happening. And it's happening for some folks and it's not happening for others. And, you know, it's got all this great cultural history, the music, the the cars, the, you know, it was used to be the capital of industry. And I think, you know, I wasn't here when the idea germinated, but, you know, I, I think the Mark Smerling and Zach Stewart-Pontier, who are the executive producers, sat down with the team and, and thought, you know, you know, where should we go and why should we go there? And I think Detroit just really jumped off the map and and that's where we landed. But I don't yeah, know, Rob, I, you might have been there for I, early I was there for a little bit of it, too, but not not all of that. But I will say that, like, I think also, you know, like which, like John was saying, there's all these big headlines about Detroit and, and crime in Detroit. But I think what our show tries to do also is kind of bring you into these personal stories 
about all of these things that are happening in Detroit and not just like stick to the headlines, but actually let people tell their stories. And, and you know, you get to meet characters from Detroit over the course of decades. And so I think that that also seemed like an opportunity to us to just, you know, let people tell their own story. So uh, like we got characters in Detroit. Yeah, this Detroit's th- got soul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's got a lot of soul. Yeah, what is it like? Uh, you probably don't know much about it before you walked in here. I mean, I had done some work here uh, as part of an oral history project before I came on to Crime Town and, uh, back in, like, 2007. So Kwame was still in office. Um, and uh, I don't quite... I, I knew there was stuff going on, but I wasn't quite sure I was more focused on my work. But, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of immediately fell in love with the place. And... Um, you know, the people just, you know, that I met through that project just really, um, I don't know, you just pick up on a person's spirit. And people are just like... Whose fucking phone? That's Bob's phone. Bob! <laughs> that was my phone, and I had to ring her off. It's damn iPhone. There's Bob. He's, that, it's the that's phone's Detroit. fault. <laughs> it is the phone's fault. <laughs> so you've been here before. Yeah, I'd been here before, and I loved the place, and I was just glad to, you know, be invited to, to you know... Uh, work on this 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 show, but uh, yeah, Detroit's got a lot of history, a lot of interesting characters, and and uh, we're we're finding out more and more as we dig deeper and deeper. So, like, uh, this is a city that's over three hundred years old. This has got a deep, deep, deep history. Three race riots, you know the whole deal. Where does your story pick up? Like, where where do you decide to start? Henry Ford. Uh, the Purple Gang went when? Uh, I, I would say post rebellion, post riots. However, you want to uh, term that event. In how are you? How, how are you terming it? Since you've been here doing this, um, I mean, I think it, it, it was a rebellion. Um, I think it was a riot. Well, we can <laughs> we can uh, differ on that, but you know, I think you know, a riot means. What, what I understand you, it's a rebellion, but a, a there riot, was shit that was a riot down, means you're though. tearing people's shit up. That's what that means. I understand it's a rebellion and things are fucked up here and they still are, but when you're tearing other people's shit up, that's a riot. Yeah. I mean, that that would qualify it. Okay, but <laughs> I digress. Yeah. Um, so so you, I th- you, start with, you start with the rebellion riot. Well, we, we, we touch on it. I, we didn't dig into that because that's been done. They just had the 50th anniversary, you know, so I think we wanted to go in a, you know, slightly different direction, but look at how did the city respond to that? You know, how did the community respond? How did the, you know, how did it respond politically? Um, and, uh, you know, within law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Um, yeah. It so responded with Coleman Young. Well, and that's really. kind of, that's, you know, that's one of the places I think we, we start, um, uh, yeah. But we also start with stress, which yeah. is the police unit that they created right after. Well, so. you, know, you know what I want to ask because it's called Crime Town, and crime is always an issue in Detroit um, as much as ever, as much as people don't like to th- believe that or want to believe different. Was there something in looking at Detroit and crime where you said, you know, that, that really worked. Why don't they do more of that? In terms of fighting it? or In terms of a solution to crime? Of, in terms of winning and, wait, and, and what, as the criminal or as the police? As the police. <laughs> okay. I'm not uh, you sh- both looked really flummoxed by yeah, the question. Yeah, because I'm, <laughs> sure I'm not sure, you know, I'll leave that for the audience to decide. You know, I'm not sure if we're going to come up with any answers. We're still in the midst of telling these stories. And, and maybe at the end, you know, in episode 20, we'll, we'll be able to, I don't know, venture a guess. But, you know, we don't. We're, yeah. we're not politicians. You guys, not, you guys don't have, like, a story arc ahead of time, right? You're, like trying to find out what's going on no i mean we we kind of have a a rough where you're going you know outline of what we you know where we want to go and the stories that we want lay lay it out for us then go give us a peek give us a (laughs) uh we i mean i think we i think we 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 gave you just a little you know bit in terms of talking about you know we're going to start with stress and uh and talk a little bit about coleman young and um but explain stress for those who stop the robberies enjoy safe streets um, it's a special undercover police unit they created in 1971. Um, John Nichols was the police commissioner at the time, and the idea was that these um, undercover police officers would basically go through tough neighborhoods in Detroit and sort of dress up like vulnerable victims and hope somebody would come and mug them so they could catch them in the act. And it became very, very controversial for because they, they, they were they were beaten ass. 
uh, there were yeah. a lot of you know officer involved shootings as a result of these these interactions and it got very controversial because many of the victims were black and the black community had a you know many of the, were, were butson and nevers were white yes. were they stress guys butson and nevers i think stress was gone by then okay right? nice. but you know it's a it's a vestigial piece of it because then you had the big four right you'd have four deep in a car driving around so then you had gang squad they were certainly on the force, though. Uh, you have special ops. I mean, on. you have reiteration. They came out of that culture. Yeah. What's that, Bob? I said Budson and Nevers, they might not have been a part of stress, but they were in the force when that was going on, and they're part of that culture. But it's important to remember, like, okay, so you're starting in the 70s. You know, I mean, heroin's around. Uh, murder goes through the roof. Now it becomes Murder City, and that's where sort of Crime Town picks up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Does this cover uh, Young Boys Incorporated, Chambers Brothers, uh, White Boy Rick? Yeah, we'll touch upon, uh, you know, all those, you know, I think uh, street gangs and, and, and drug culture um, and what law enforcement was, was trying to do about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we were trying to approach everything uh, from a balanced perspective. That's why I couldn't venture a guess as to what the solution should be. Um, we're talking to the people that lived it. Um, experienced it firsthand, were involved um, from the dealers to the to the narcs who were trying to bring them down. Um, See, so that's awesome. I mean, what have you been learning? Um, I mean, it's that it's a complicated, intricate web of of intrigue, yeah. and and it's 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 very it's and long, and I and mean, also it's been going just on for decades. Yeah, I think you know when you're looking at cause and effect. That's kind of where I think things start to be revealed in terms of where these people come from. When you sit down and you know you talk to a you know uh, a drug dealer uh, who was doing his thing back then, uh, you I'm asking you know where did you grow up? What was it like? Who were your parents? What did they do? And then you know then you get to a sort of snapshot of the human being. And you know granted they you know made some poor choices you know, maybe along the way, but I think, you know, to get that story and then juxtapose that with, you know, where the where the law enforcement's coming from, who they are, what they're doing, what their, you know, background is. You know, Crime Town is exploring the culture of crime in an American city. And culture encompasses all those things, like, you know, what your parents do, what do their parents do? Um, Where did you, know, you go to school? What side of the city did you grow up? Where did you go that, to church? That's so true because, you know, when I come home, I'm realizing in this town it goes like the, Coleman Young is the dividing line, right? Everybody wants to think that's like year zero, but it's not. I was surprised to learn this. We're taught it was the end of the uh, Underground Railroad, right? You figure we're the north, and yet until 1950, it was illegal to ban blacks and Jews from certain neighborhoods and, and homes. Uh, the fact that the mayor in 1930 was removed, he was mobbed up and clanned up. The mayor in the 40s went to prison, he was Republican. The last Republican mayor of Detroit, Louis Mariani, went to prison in 69. It wasn't, you know, this culture of corruption and crime. We had the Purple Gang. We had cops kill 128 people in 1928. This is not taught to us. So, Did you say Republican mayor? Yeah, the last Republican mayor. In 69? He went, yeah, he left office, I believe, in 62 or 64, and they ended up, he ended up going away in 69. Wow. So it's, it's all of our culture. It's not black, it's not white, it's not Democratic, it's not Republican. It's all of us. And so when you called me, I was really pleased that here would be some artistic, professional, rugged people interested in capturing the history, you know, just capturing the people that are still alive to get it done and get it done right. And I suspect you now know more than all of us here. So tell me maybe one or two things we might not know that will be coming on the show that teach us something about ourselves and the greater world about us. I mean, I'm not sure that. How's that? Uh, How's that? I, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, just, man. I'm really into that. <laughs> that's though, a good like. question, Charlie. But I, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know if it's because I'm trying. I don't think I would feel comfortable saying that we're going to teach you something. No, no, you know, no. I mean, out tell of those stories, somebody is going to draw some conclusions. I can tell you that. What might we have not have known? Like, like, was White Boy Rick as big as they say he was? 
That's an argument. Now, you, you've delved into everybody. You've talked to 100 people at least. At least. What was White Boy Rick is uh, the big kingpin as is, is he's portrayed to us? Um, I mean, I, was YBI as organized as they say it was? Uh, I don't want to give too much away about. Give what us a the, little bit. I know about what, what the season's about, but I think when you look at, I think when you look at these, you know, sort of drug dealers, and you know what they went through to get where they are, you're, you know, in some ways, forget about the legality of what they're doing. You can't help but to be impressed of their survival skills. You know what I mean? And and then you look at sort of politicians and what they do to get where they are and to keep what they have. And I would say it's not all that dissimilar. Woo! So that may be a walk, you know, takeaway. And I think that's in, gen great in general. I like that. In general, I would say that's kind of some of the things I would learn. But... Yeah, I don't I want to get into yeah. specifics because I want people to listen, and I don't want to give too much away. Can, can you tell? Can you tell me? You're talking to drug dealers who were big in the '80s with YBI and stuff like that. You're talking to them now, right? Yes. How are those guys doing? Because I, I, I wonder well, what happens to a guy who was a huge drug kingpin in the '80s. Where is he? Does he have grandkids? Is he a doting grand? I, mean, I, I know. Is, I know one of them. You know, lives in Southfield because so, the schools. How's his are 401k better, doing? Because the schools are better for the kids. Um, Which just goes to I show mean, you. I mean, I would say that I if, you it, it if you're varies, alive. Right? I mean, it kind of depends. Yeah, it depends. And I think if they're alive and we're talking to them, you know, and they're not in jail or six feet under, it's they kind of, they won. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying they're doing, they're, you know, as great as you and I, you know. Do they dote on their grandkids? I mean, we don't usually invite the grandkids. Yeah, we don't invite. Them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, they probably lived in long enough to 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 see their grandkids. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's, which you're not supposed to do. In that you're not life. supposed to do. You don't. A lot of these guys, that, you know, it's just amazing when we were able to find them, and they can, you know. Are they running new cons? I that I I. I you think I they're gonna know. gonna say that? Joe? I don't. I don't know. They like we're not. We're not investigative reporters here. We're we're. I try to. You know. We all. I think try to meet people where they stand and and feel honored that they want to share their story with us and and we try to get into the nitty gritty and the details of who they are and and I'm not here to judge. So I. You know. It, whatever they're doing now is their business. Whatever they want to share with us about what they're doing now, you know, we're happy to listen. But. You know, yeah, and nine like times some of them are like working and you know, like you know, as janitors or as construction. Yeah, you know, they're like working like you know, honest jobs like yeah. that. Yeah, so. so drug dealing, yeah. drug dealing is a young man's game. Uh, you have to listen. I'm kind of depends. You have to, I mean, yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll yeah. see. I don't, you know, I don't think we're. My question: how, We're not teaching anybody how to be. I, a drug I'm dealer. interested as as a journalist. I'm interested. How did you Ooh. find? Ooh, I know Bob is a journalist. I'm learning Ooh. something. Charlie doesn't like that word. <laughs> it's a reporter. As a, as a reporter. As a, reporter. a street guy. How did, how did you find them? Uh, just a lot of. I mean, police records from. A lot of cold calls. A lot of calls. digging. A lot of connecting the dots. Um, you know, this person knows this person. Right. You know, you also have to have people kind of vouch for you. Sure. You know, I can't just walk waltz into that world and say, hey, tell me your story. Hi, I'm from a, a show called Crime <laughs> Town, yeah. and I want you on it. Spill your beans. Um, yeah. And and so, yeah, you have to, I mean, you guys know, you got to get, some, you know, people to trust you and yeah, it's, and it's just keep it real, you know what I mean? Yeah, I tell yeah. them where I'm coming from and why I want to hear their story and and let them do it. You, you have know, to. I'm not, I, I, as a reporter, I just a lot of the time I feel like I'm just li I'm there to listen. I'm like a. You have to you know, seduce, channel. like Janice Malcolm said. You you have to seduce a little bit, but I'm not as good as you at seducing, Charlie. Well, I, I'm you know, learning, but I, I I think it's it is an art form in a sense of like how you know it's a people skill, and I'm still learning how to do that. But uh, I mean, man, you got Kilpatrick, you got Kilpatrick. In prison, you've been talking to him for a year, uh, roughly, dude. Almost. He never met you, hasn't laid eyes on you, and nobody 
here can get to him. How? Uh, I don't, you know. You asked. I know, you asked. and, and These are the parts I, that won't make the show. Yes, this I, is your personal. But he wouldn't talk to people, Charlie. Well, like, you know, Elric, have... he, would, he wouldn't talk to you because he knows you know too much he for him my... to squirrel. He probably he knows not... everything. No, I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just saying I wonder if Kilpatrick is naive enough to think that I might be able to snow this guy. Sean, have you, you, you sat down with the FBI and the U.S. attorney that prosecuted, and, right? I mean, we've spoken to yeah the the people who have. Um, you may know more than any of us. Kill Patrick quite down. Frankly. I mean, I I have, I have some perspective. And you too, on Rob. That. I don't you know. Yeah, I don't yeah. Mean to dismiss it. He's, but, he's been reporting a lot of this. But, yeah. but the depth of what you know. I mean, he he I, he does know more than me. I remember I came in and. But does Kwame know that? I, I'm I just trying to get at why Kwame would I, talk to him. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I can't imagine. I'm wondering why. Too. I asked, and you know, I, I guess the presentation. Um, it was an opportunity. It's uh, as I said, you know, we're offering people an opportunity to tell their story in their own words, and you know, I perhaps because I don't come from Detroit, I don't have skin in the game in that sense. That you know, as an outsider, maybe I, I you'd have to ask Kwame. I don't know why he said yes to me, and and no to others. Um, I feel very fortunate. Uh, you know, to be kind of invited into his his world, and uh, yeah. So, was he selling anything? Was he selling anything? I mean, he's always selling something. I but. mean, I'm listening to his story. If you, you you know, I think I don't feel like he's making a sales pitch to me. I mean, I mean about maybe the truth or what he says the truth is. I mean, I think I know you're talking about a broader I mean, subject, but. I think you'll have to listen and decide for yourself. Oh. I can't really, I, you know, I, I, no. I'm, a, I'm, I'm better at listening and, and, and not so good at, at, at like, sort of judging. You know? Something tells me you're not done with that portion of the story. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, know, you're, and I know personally that you're still in the middle of reporting this. And yet, Monday, we're, this is Friday we're recording, the show hits episode one and you don't have episode three four five six twenty in the can so this is really interesting and unique you you don't know where this is going do you well we don't we don't have you know you know everything is not wrapped up but we have a lot of i don't know rob how many hours of reporting do we have oh i, I couldn't even begin to tally I, I, mean, I mean we've probably done how many different people like 60 50 something like that something like that so we have we have a lot of material and we could you know but yeah we're still we still want more stories so yeah we do have to return to Detroit like you know we're here now reporting and uh, we'll continue to come back as and we're gonna keep working on these stories too even though we have some of this raw audio it's like you know we just got to put the hours in to hone these stories and, and figure out what they're all about so. it's not like a binge listen you know you release them separately uh, that's be not released weekly yeah yeah they'll be released okay. weekly. So, like no BS news, yeah. <laughs> um, how far does it go to present? Is that is that where your your you go to today? Yeah. So, what's changed politically, criminally, anything? Because Qu Kwame Kilpatrick comes from the McNamara machine, which is Wayne County, Michigan, which was Ed McNamara out of Livonia, the whitest city. His number two is the current mayor, Mike Duggan, from Livonia. Bernard Kilpatrick was the number three from the blackest city, Detroit. The number four was Jennifer Granholm, the, the former governor. So does this episode with Kwame, has it ended? Are, are, are we back? Is, are we have a clean slate? Is, is crime under control? What, what do you see? <laughs> you know better than I. <laughs> what, We're what's... still trending down, uh, as I reported out. <laughs> It's our police chief telling us about crime going down. <laughs> uh, Whose department is caught up in a federal investigation. The deputy chief went to prison for taking bribes from the towing titan, who's also been put in prison, who was a witness during the, the Kwame Kilpatrick trial. Idiots doing idiot things because they're idiots. Yeah, I, it's hard for me to say where we're going to land and what you're going to learn from that. I'm I'm on this journey, you know, with you guys, and and I think for people, you know, like you, Charlie's been on the ground reporting for 
for years here and know the ins and outs of City Hall and how it's worked and know the history of a place. You know, I, I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm learning from you, you know, what that's about. And, um, you know, and I think I'll learn something from this and we'll all learn something. I mean, I think Rob. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah, I don't you know, he, you know, I'm sure we're all learning. We're, we're getting introduced to Detroit. We're not experts in Detroit. I don't want to profess that I am. I'm just you know, these are some stories that we're trying to tell. It's not going to tell the whole story, um, but it, it will give you a snapshot of certain parts of Detroit culture and life. Um, that perhaps you've never heard before. But there are probably some things that people are like, oh, I knew that already, and it's, we're sharing this with the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is going to go out to the world. And, um, you know, we hope people will, um, I don't know. I don't know if we want to hope to change yeah. people's minds about anything. I think we want to inform um, and entertain and, you know, and, and just kind of make people think. Yeah, not, I, I, if if you try to change my mind, then, <laughs> then then you failed in what you're doing. But I'm wondering, are you gonna open my eyes? I don't know, man. Probably not. I, I hope so. Probably, probably, wait, I wait, so. wait, 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 wait. We'll edit that out. Goal. We're gonna That's edit that. Let me help you with this. Oh fuck yeah! <laughs> oh yeah, this you gotta yeah, listen. Yeah, to I'm gonna do We're gonna tell you stuff you, ne you never sell. knew. Yeah, yeah. Pitch the damn show. We're gonna blow your fucking mind because you did. You did. Can I say that on. What, yeah, you yeah. can. You did with with Providence. Blew my fucking mind, little sleepy clam chowder town. Holy fuck! You guys worked on that, yeah? A little bit. I came in at Rob. the end of that. Yeah. yeah. Did you? At, at very tail end, you know, bonus episodes. Oh, I like this even better then because it's gonna have a different. With that, with, we played that whole trailer. Different vibe. Like I, I feel with that trailer, you got our energy. Right. You really did. Plus. It was transitional. Hi, oh, well, well, you know, Detroit and the comeback city and... Right? right. Yeah. It, just, it rocks. And we wanted to sound like Detroit. You know, we had... We actually did a recording session uh, a couple months ago at Rust Belt Studios. Um, I, I don't know that... It's, like, right outside of Detroit. But we had, like, local musicians come and do session recordings and stuff. Like, like you're kind of su suggesting, we want it to sound like Detroit and feel like Detroit. You know, we want it to be unique to Detroit. That's recordings. They drew recording sessions. Try this hard? That's amazing. I I'm sitting there eating three-day-old pizza out your fridge, and these guys got a recording budget. No, I think it's cool as hell. Uh, you know, I love old radio, uh, the production value, and it's just, I think it's great that people do it. First of all, you're doing actual reporting and, and having production as well, because I hear so many podcasts, and the production is just not... All that great, or there's not a great effort made, and, and it's great to see somebody getting well. Thirty million downloads helps a lot, I'm sure. I mean, we're very fortunate. He loves uh, that thirty million have, downloads. You know, said that a couple hey, times. I yeah, guess. no, I mean. they, they bought the right. They bought the rights to a death song. I mean, geez. Ask me how my book's doing, Drew. How's your book doing? I don't know. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> I think you're getting some checks. <laughs> um, how do you arrange to talk with Kilpatrick? Give I mean, you heard it on the the trailer. I mean, he calls me, and uh, and I. I Is take, it always I from the payphone? Is it always from the payphone? I, as far as I know, as far as you know, as far as I know, that's that's pretty good. Did, did uh, does he seem humbled to you? Um, do you want him to be as real? compared to what? Well, you hear him making those speeches. Well, back in There's, the day when he first uh, was put in prison for 18 months, he said, you done set me up for a comeback. I didn't sense that he was a very humbled guy. No, that, that was when he was resigning. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, he ended up getting 18 months. Yeah. I mean, I, th I, think, I think Kwame has is, is changed from his experiences. Really? Yeah. And w is there anything you attribute that, attribute that to? Probably prison. Prison. <laughs> <laughs> Prison. I'm sorry. I, Prison, I just, the circumstance. I'm not convinced that he's not, not insightful on this show. I'm not convinced <laughs> that he's not a sociopath. So, um, I, I thought I'm maybe. Not a, I, I, you know, I don't. You know, I'm. I, I don't know if I'd say that about Kwame. I think that that's not. You know, like I said, for me to, to judge. Uh, maybe he's entitled up the wazoo. I, you know. It's a complicated story. He's a three-dimensional. He's a three-dimensional character. I don't. You know, I, and, and you know, he's. He's he's a human, and uh, he's did you hear remorse? Mistakes. I've heard remorse. Okay, I've heard remorse. Well, that would be progress for him. Yeah. Damn. Um, what about the, you? Tie in crime, the the riots, the changeover. Um, 
you're doing something on, on fire because that was such a big part of. I, I was hoping you'd maybe help us out with that because of your book, Detroit. Uh, but, you know, I think we want to cover events in the city and, and we're, we're looking for stories, you know, so that, you, that you, will you, resonate that, that, in a way that can tell you, tell you more about what's happening here. When people look at the sort of snapshots of Detroit, why does Detroit look like this? You know, why does it feel like this? You know, why? And you, why? Ha- and you have to, by virtue of sound, give people a mental image. That's the, the okay. layering. So I got a treat for you, boys. I'm, uh, on the line is the um, president of the Detroit Firefighters Union, 30, 30 year vet. His father was on the fire department. So wow. we'll, we'll have him on. It's, hey, Mike. How you doing, Charlie? I'm good. It's Mike Nevin from the Detroit Firefighters Association. I want you to say hello to the uh, producers or some of the producers. The, the hard well, work. Know, the hard work. I ones. know. I know Bob. He's your sidekick, and I'm listening to uh, your show. And I grew up on the East Side in the '80s, and I know a little bit. I have my own opinion of what happened over there with White Boy Rick in the neighborhood and all that. I I ran those streets over there as a kid. Well, let me ask you. So you and your dad are both firefighters, right? Yep. Um, by the way, it's John White and Rob Zipko from Crime Town. Say hello to him, Mike. John, John and Rob, how are you guys? Hey, Mike. Hey, how you doing, man? Nice so, to meet good. you. Mike, I met, I met you when I came back in 2008. You know, and as I wrote, growing up, it was never great like my mom was saying. It was always, you know, the factories were closing and shit was burning. But when I came back in 2008, I was like, what? I was saying, what happened here? So in 2008, around that Kilpatrick time, and the last, I don't want to say the last embers of Devil's Night, but what happened and what was going on in 2008? These guys uh, ask, actually asked me, so you, you can tell them and the listeners. Well, my dad came on in 57. I came on in 1987, so I'm pushing into my 30, 32nd year. And it, it started with the pullout of the auto industry. And when you had these companies and these manufacturers pulling out, it uh, created a, some of the people followed the factories, and the factories didn't take any, everyone with them, which left a lot of space, a lot of empty homes, and a lot of broken hearts and, and wallets. And there was one way out of the city, and it was to uh, torture house. And it became insurance. a ritual insurance on, on Devil's job. Night. They figured it, hey, it kind of happened almost by accident. And it started to happen during the Pole Town era. Hey, when Mike. They were building the Pole Town project. Hey, Mike. And, and, and Mike. I'll tell you what, we had a lot of that. Mike! The, uh, hey, Mike. Yes, sir. You're saying uh, people were torching their houses because it was an insurance job. Well, of course, we know that. Just like Well, done- that's a big deal for a firefighter to say. Like, one of the reasons this time, because look, man, we were always told it's crackheads and people trying to burn out crackheads. That's horseshit. It w- so it was white people burning their houses down to collect the insurance to get to the burbs. And it happened up and down Van Dyke when they announced the city airport in the 90s. Uh, the DMZ, we call it, uh, right off Van Dyke, uh, off the freeway there, off 94. You look at that area there, pretty desolate. Um, you know, firemen aren't stupid. And um, we, we know what's going on. And we know arson from birds, birds and matches. You know, it was a, it's a funny joke in the fire department. I'll say, what do you think started the fire? Well, birds and matches. Yeah, right. <laughs> birds and matches. Um you know, and then and then it became arson for profit. You know, first it became, you know, maybe getting rid of the vacant eyesore. Then maybe someone was cashing in here or there. And, you know, it's kind of like the old shampoo commercial. You tell two friends and so on and so on and so on. Well, it became an epidemic. And um, that epidemic exists today and with business owners. And, and we've had firefighters injured and, and killed in some of these uh some of these arson for profit scams, aka Walter Harrison. You were there his last day, Charlie, having dinner with us. Uh, it broke my heart, Mike, because I'm, I'm going to yeah, say, gonna say was, this: hey. when I when I met you, and you guys had holes in your boots, and the rigs were leaking, and yep. uh, Kilpatrick was on trial, and it looted the city. And there's no doubt in my mind that he did. And I I, I never forgive anybody in position of power that profits for himself and his gang, but. Walt dies, his alarm doesn't work when the house falls yep. on him, and he suffocates. He doesn't burn to death. You couldn't find him. Acute asphyxiation. 
And then you guys, you, I'm on my way to New York City to take my daughter to the parade, and you call me up. I'm, I'm going to tell everybody now. You go you, ahead. You call me, and you said the firefighters had prepped that house that they would not tear down to burn it to the ground. You yep. were going to light it on fire. Arson. You. Fuck. We, the firefighters, were going to get rid of that eyesore because it had become a shrine to failure. And we didn't want T-shirts and teddy bears and flowers. And we didn't want to drive by that anymore because we looked at it as a failure. We lost one of the greatest firefighters this job will ever see, family man, minister, and our hearts were broken. We couldn't stand to look at that place. And we were begging the city, get rid of this thing through an emergency demolition. And they weren't, they weren't listening to us at the time. Uh, and you said, listen, you guys just hold your horses and let me make some phone calls. And I got a, a phone call from uh, a council person, um, and she said, uh, I'm going to make a motion to have that emergency uh, demo. It will be done tomorrow at 10 a.m. I said, can you make it 11? I want to call the family. And as you recall, um, the family was there. It was Walt's wife and his kids, and we watched that piece of shit get torn down, and it made us feel better. It was, it was a victory just to get rid of that. We didn't want to look at it anymore. It was a loss for us. And you know what, man? I just remember you guys crying like it was the biggest thing ever. Yep. And I remember saying to the guy, living with his wife and his kids in the house across the street, I said, I told you I'd get it torn down. He said, thank you. What about the rest of them? And you and I went out there, what, a couple months ago, and that thing's abandoned and burned up. Yeah, the one in front. That was Sheila Cockrell that was the one that called me at the firehouse. And she's, she knew I knew Sheila from my prior union days. This is my second stint in the union. And she said, Mike, don't, don't, don't do anything. We'll get that thing taken down for you. We got it on the list. And um, it'll be down in the morning. And I tell you, it was, it was a good thing. I got to tell uh, John and Rob. John and Rob. And so when I got here, this guy, you know, you're talking about what happened, what's wrong. The department was getting looted. Like there were contracts for houses that didn't exist. Checks getting cashed. And uh, I met Mike, and we engaged in trying to get this th shit cleaned up. And they they rolled him out of his job twice. Yeah. Like cold cock fired him. One time, a guy on his rig took a screen door off of an abandoned house because the firehouse didn't have one. And he got fired for letting his guys, quote unquote, loot. Looting the city. Wow. This, this yeah, is what we live with. And it flies in the firehouse and laying on the floor. And shit, I worked at a door company for a while, but <laughs> they said let's let's give it a try. Try to make it work because they had, they had bed sheets hanging there in the um, in the doorways and stuff because they didn't even have doors on the firehouse. And uh, I mean, it, they were pretty poor times. And we've come a long way. Uh, we really have. We're, we've come a long way. But you know, the the thing that bothers me is we're starting to. We're, we're slipping backwards now again. Um, you know, we just can't, for some reason in the city of Detroit, I don't know what it is, we just can't hold on to the trophy. You know, I mean, you get close, we're in the playoffs, and we just, we, we can't win. And, and we're going backwards again now. And I, I don't like it. I see a lot of the same stuff creeping back into the department, police, fire, and EMS. And... Um, it's just starting to stink around here again, and I don't like it. I think we were doing pretty good for a while, but it's starting to stink again. Well, Your organization's you are, terrible. <laughs> uh, you, you, not my organization. Well, here's the thing that, you know, in the last week, did not go report. I reported. I, I, I'm shocked that nobody did. We, we got the, the new crime statistics, right? And the headline reads, we're not number one. St. Louis is the most violent. But if you look at the report from the FBI, violent crime went up. Violent crime went up. There's no doubt about it. It's gone up every year. Firefighters now respond to ambulance runs. They're overworked. Uh, nobody's gotten a raise. At the same time, verify this for me, the mayor has asked for 5% cuts in public safety. Let me say it to you like this. The Detroit firefighters on those rigs, covering 139 square miles of a city unlike any city in the United States, a city that you could literally fit Manhattan, San Francisco, and Boston on the inside with departments twice the size, are covering one of the largest waterways with an old 50-year-old fireboat, 
and 27 engines, uh, 14 trucks, and, and 20 medics, and four part-time medics, 24 hours a day, 365. We are averaging 4,000 fire incidents a month. We are averaging 2,000, 2,100 medical first responder fire runs a month, and we are averaging about 12,100 uh, EMS runs a month. That's near 7,000 runs. Times that by rigs in the street. You got 80 to 90,000 rigs busting around the city every month. EMS today is at about 475 runs for this month. That's unbelievable for a city this size with such a small workforce. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. And the word we got was in that the mayor wants to cut all budgets 5% at a time when he should be looking at improving public safety to win the confidence of the residents and the business owners and the people that work and play and do whatever they do in the city. Listen, when you call 911, that's, you're in an unmanageable situation. That you, It's beyond your scope of humanity, whether it's a cat in a tree, a suitcase with wires hanging out of it, a smoke alarm, smoke detector, a man down, smoke in a dwelling, smoke on a 12th floor. You expect us to be there and be there fast to mitigate the scene. That's our job. Okay, we're not bitching okay. about that. We went through the bankruptcy. We got our asses kicked. And now we're, now they're talking cuts and redeployments. Well, I mean, when the billionaires are standing there with tin cups in their hands. We don't have reti we have no retiree health care. Did you hear what I said? While we're, we're writing multi-million dollar checks to billionaires. Correct. Does it piss you off? The EMS employee, the EMS tech. And it takes a lot of hours to go to school to be an EMS guy. These guys are the finest in the United States. Start off at $15.45 an hour. Holy fuck. Now, you know what? Here's what, I, here's what they can do because they're a little bit hungry with making that kind of money. They should go to American Coney Island. You know what I mean? American Coney Island. She raises paying? money oh. for the widows and orphans. You know that, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Chili Cook-Off every year. It was founded by Guest Caros in 1972. It's Detroit's oldest family-run restaurant and is the original home of the famous Detroit Coney Dog. You like those, don't you? Chili, mustard, onion, and... Right? I do specials, man, everything. Put it, put it all on there. Yeah, now it's located downtown Detroit at Lafayette and Michigan Avenue. It's a favorite of firefighters since the food there is always fresh, always delicious, and the joint's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The dogs snap when you bite them, and the chili's an old family recipe made especially for the American Coney dog. Can't come downtown. They also have locations at the Detroit Zoo and the D Hotel in Las Vegas, or you can order a Coney Island kit straight to your or your friend's door. So go to AmericanConeyIsland.com. Anyway, man. I didn't, know there was a, I didn't know there was a commercial, Charlie, until you're like 20 seconds in. Well, that was I'm, fucking great. I think he did that <laughs> one for us, man. It was really good, wasn't and, it? <laughs> and just, hey, and just to, to add, and that was the EMS guys. And our firefighters start off at 35 grand a year, 52 hours a week. So when, when the public said, wow, well, you work Wait, a day, let me say this. Wait, let me say this. The, the retirees... The old ones, not the ones that are 55 and 60, but the ones that are 70, never yeah. paid into Medicare, correct? No, no so, health care. So they they're don't not, get the Medicare. So they have to take the pension, go on the exchange yep. to get their dentures, their stents, yep. their colostomy bags. This is fucked up. One of the smallest, one of the fattest this, pensions this boys, in this country. This is one the of crime. The smallest, it one ain't of the over. Smallest Go ahead. Um, yeah, let me, let me get on the soapbox. This Go ahead, do is it. the ongoing crime. This is what all of America is angry about. We don't have anything. We're not honoring the promise to each other. It's a, I, 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 no, we're, no, we're not. We're breaking promises. What are you talking about? You're, you're stealing. You're, open, you're legalized. You have legalized theft. Now listen to this. Through legislation and through laws. Now watch I mean, this. Watch this. Is corruption done? Is it? We got a lot of federal uh, grand juries and investigations going on, not the least of which is in the city council. City councilman Gabe Leland is tied up with Gasper Fiore, the towing titan, who's gone to prison and is cooperating with the feds. Nobody can get to him about taking free meals, taking bags of money, allegedly. But Joe, the 58-year-old intern, you got this ready, Bob? The 58-year-old intern is meeting up with me 
at the American Coney Island to go do our Joe dies on the street, who's going to help him? And he runs in to Gabe Leland. So here's the ongoing education of Joe, the 58-year-old intern, who's a mechanic. He gets the exclusive. I'm pretty proud of Joe. He's, 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 he's got some raw talent, if not clean socks. Bob, roll the tape. Excuse me, Councilman. Yeah. How you doing? What's My name is Joe DeMarco. I'm with Charlie LaDuff's No Bullshit News Hour. Oh, okay. You know, first off, white councilman we've had in decades. What's that guy do you like? <sighs> you get a lot of flat? I, uh, no, I just enjoy, you know, yeah? I, I, I work hard. And yeah. when you work hard, you know. You get you get things. No, I just, you know, I just work hard. You know, I help the constituents. Yeah. You know, I've never had a problem. I mean, you know, my father and I, you know, go back to, you know, 1981. Yeah. To elected office, you know, uh, race never comes up. I, I got to run. So they say that you're on, a, you're you're being investigated by the FBI. They're looking to indict you for something. What's up with that? You know, <laughs> careful. I'm just working hard. Just okay. Doing my job. Right. Does that involve taking money from Casper Fiore? Like I said, I'm you just got working a hard. You for Fiore at all? I'm just working hard. I'm doing my job, taking care of my constituents. And who are your constituents? I represent District 7. Is Fiore one of them? On the west side. Okay, so he's <laughs> donated money to the campaign, giving you cash directly. What has he done? Why, why are the fact if you want to, you know, If you want to come you know, to, to the west side and to District 7, yeah. ask my constituents you know, how, how I'm doing. They'll, they'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm delivering services, you know, I'm working hard, and, and, that, right. and that's what matters. Okay, good talking. I got talking to run. Wow, that's how about that, Mike? Huh, John? Wow, that's pretty solid. What do you think, John? Great job, Joe. That's that's good reporting right there, got man. It's, but what do you think? You got him to answer the question, kind of. But I, when you don't answer it, you yeah. answered it, right? Yeah. Ask it again, you know. Joe, oh, no. is Joe gonna play dead? Uh, yeah. So, uh, hey, Mike, I gotta yes, let sir. you. I gotta let you go. We gotta get Joe on here. We 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 got. No worries. Okay. Hey, thanks for having me on the bullsh- on the no bullshit news. Thank you, man. Thanks, thanks Mike. I no hope bullshit. to see you soon. See you, Bob. Detroit firefighters love you, bro. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. So, you guys, yeah. what do you what do you think? We probably you haven't talked to him yet, have you? No, no, I'd love to. Okay, so there you go. An ongoing show, Crime Town, uh, premieres Monday. Spotify specifically. Yep, exclusively on Spotify. Uh, I'll I'll be getting it, man. I'm really impressed with you as people. Please and, do. And, Please and listen. Work. Now. Um, let me just introduce this. We're trying to get Joe on the phone here. Let me know when you got him. I'll, I'm going to introduce this here, Bob. Uh, as part of Joe's education, I'm, I'm educating Joe. The journalism comes in sort of all forms, expository, uh, the future story. There's also participatory. I, I'm known to participate in stories. I've crossed the border with Mexican migrants. I've worked in a slaughterhouse. I live blind in New York. Hey, Bob, I can't hear myself. I live blind in New York for a year, uh, for a week. And uh, so I'm trying to teach Joe how to be participatory to sort of, this is almost like a candid camera or a what would you do? So if we are the most violent, does that mean we have a hard heart? So I sent Joe out to play dead to see if anybody would react to him while I was sitting in a car. And um, this is what we came up with. And I'm gonna play it and then uh, get back to Joe's here. No bullshit news. Joe, just lay there and look dead. Just lay there and look dead, all right? The outside is slow, so you should get some help here. Help here? Just go over there and look dead. Okay. Don't blink. Okay, so I'm laying here looking dead. I don't look dead. What does a dead guy look like? I don't think I'm laying right. How long am I supposed to lay here? Joe, you don't look dead if you're moving. Trying to be in the right position, man. You don't look dead if you're moving and talking so loud. Should I be like face down or what? <laughs> Here comes some people. A couple of hipsters. They didn't even look. They're not even looking, Joe. Grown a little bit. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, they <laughs> fucked me up. Oh, man. They're taking pictures oh, right over his corpse. Oh. Here comes some more people. People Some nice white ladies. Premium coffee in their hand. <laughs> give him a look. Give him a look. Oh, it's nice. How beautiful. Oh. 
can't get it with her foot. I don't know. I don't know. It hurt. Excellent. Yeah. No. Nice. You saying you need an ambulance? You know this guy? Sit up, sit up, sit up, get some fever. You guys know each other? Okay. He'll be all right. Yeah, thank you. Guys. I just want to, I just saw him laying face yeah, down. Yeah. He worried me. You all right? Oh, man. Hey, thank you for caring. <laughs> hey, Joe, come here. So when, uh... Okay, maybe you're overdoing that just a bit. When someone asks you for help, they want to, right? Right. You go, you no, I'm to call an ambulance? I, I said, no, no. No, I said, I'm doing an experiment. Does anybody care? No. Oh, okay. You sit there and keep going, uh-huh. That's what, because I forgot to ask you, what should I tell people? Oh, God. And they ask, How, what the, what's going on? So Joe, what are you going to do, them? sit there and make them shit their pants? Okay, now we're in front of the, front of the police headquarters. Right. You lay there, and somebody comes up, don't carry on, being dead. So you you're doing an experiment to see if anybody cares. Right. That's it. How long it takes for somebody to actually care? Give a shit. Got some good attention right away. <laughs> Joe, what the fuck, dude? Did you not get it? I'm going to have to uh, guess and say that I don't take it. Uh, check now, Joe. I don't know how much I can impress upon you. Radio needs sound. <laughs> So if you're not recording, it's no good. I hit the ground too hard and shook the CD card. So you, you, you did a prat fall out there and, and broke the equipment? What are you doing? The, um, Joe. We didn't get the police it, one. It doesn't, oh my God, dude. Get over there at the bus stop and go lay dead. Press record, please. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, there's Joe laying in between the book Cadillac and the bus depot. Middle of the sidewalk. I don't know what he's doing. But he really does look homeless. And, and, and those are his regular clothes. Uh, okay. Oh. You want an ambulance? You want an ambulance? No, no, I don't need no ambulance. No, no. We're just, do, we're just doing a bit. We're just doing a bit to see if people care. And apparently, y'all care. That's a good thing. <laughs> What's going on, Joe? I didn't even get on the ground good, and people were coming to see if I was okay. Yeah, just say you're okay and get on the ground and let him let it warm up. Like, yeah, I'm okay. Right? Yeah. Go back there and do it again. Just lay on the ground. Tell him you're okay. Joe can't even hit the ground, and people care about him. Detroit is a nice town. I know it's the second most violent city in America, but people are damn sweet. I hope I'm still recording. Man, where'd that shit come from? Oh, well, somebody threw a water bottle. <laughs> I think somebody threw a bottle at Joe because he was not needing any help. You got a mic on you, man. Oh, yeah, we, yeah we're doing a bit to see if... Get up, man. <laughs> oh, now they're now they freaking out because I got a microphone. What type of show y'all doing? We're doing a bit just to see, you know, it's What's about public doing? safety, really, and how people in Detroit react. To see different things with somebody come and help. Like one of them. Did we do what, a good job you do to help you? Right, you did, you did. Except we're up through the water bottle. Okay. We ain't done, no, no, no. The, the, we just right. wanted to uh, see what was. Who is talking to you? You got to go. Right now. Right there, across the street. Y'all play with me. Charlie McDuck. That's Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> we thought she was for real. I thought she was having a heart attack. Yeah, I, I thought care. she was out there. I, I was hammering it. I told the little bitch to call the ambulance. She said, I'm sorry. Right. Don't bullshit news. Don't bullshit news. Hello. Hello. Hey, Joe. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Hey, how you doing? 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 Hey, Oh, I can't do that though. There's Why not? toilets in the boss's office. <laughs> what you need? You need permission to use the toilet, Joe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I. I, I okay, listen. Right. Listen. Don't worry about the camera. Listen, Joe. 
I'm not worried about the boss watching me on the camera. Joe, man. Joe, but, listen to me. I got the two. Yeah. I got two guys here from Crime Town. You know the show, right? Very big, big deal. Um, they've been listening to your work. What do you guys think? Uh, I think you know, Joe. You're you're learning. You're you're getting. You're earning your keep and uh, cutting your teeth. In uh, you you yeah. listen listen. I feel like we me off guard I'm there. About to cut the one of my coworkers here. Listen to the background. He's you gonna think, cut a coworker. You think there might you think there might be a little uh, maybe side work you guys could come up with for Joe? He's he's unpaid and <laughs> and he's you hear uh, what this works. This job like. is not very conducive to what I'm doing with Charlie. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna. It's take, almost got playing dead down, kind of, <laughs> sort of. Well, I'm proud of you, Joe. I'm actually. I think you did good work. Listen, don't call it a bit. It's an experiment. Right, we're not bitten, okay. but you did really well. I'm proud of you. You're really growing. I mean, I can do editing. I can do video editing, audio editing. I can do a lot of things. But you can't press record, Joe. You got to be oh, able to press record. <laughs> I press record. Is I hit the ground so hard the shirt to SD card move. No, that's not true because I listened to the tape and there was none of you getting out of the car, walking up, jumping up, doing the prat. No, I didn't even give you that file. The file has zero bytes. And then you didn't give us the file, Joe. Okay, anyway, listen. I'm proud of you. You've done well. I got a surprise for you. Are you ready? Yeah. It's not sure. money, but I got, you, I got you a press pass and a parking okay. placard. Okay, that's, that's progress. And I'm giving you a promotion, Joe. Are you ready? I'm ready for a promotion. Your title. Sure. You may introduce yourself when you're out on the street. Chief Deputy Intern. Oh, shut up. Ooh. Yeah, no, I'm serious. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, get back to work. Um, see ya. Uh, guys. Uh, yeah, you're gone, Joe. See ya, Joe. Good job. All right, yeah, thanks, man. Okay, man, way to go. John White, Rob Zipko, Crime Town, new season two, Detroit, out on Spotify, Monday. Monday, Monday. October what, 1st. What time Monday. I think uh, I think it's going to drop first thing in the morning. So, so what do our listeners do? Your feed will subscribe be to Spotify. On Spotify, yeah. you go to the Spotify app. There's a po podcast tab, and you just search Crime Town, and I think you hit follow. And, and then, that's it. That's it. That's hey, can easy. I ask, do. I can ask a question? I'm sure a lot of people who listen to us are asking: Is um, why is it just on Spotify? Like, you know, a lot of people complained when we were only on iTunes, for example. Or can I get you on Alexa? Or why just Spotify? Is it just a deal you cut with Spotify? I assume. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we know the ins and outs of that, yeah. but I think, you know, that's um, that's what's happening this year. Okay. These are the artists. Uh, thanks for coming to our town and caring, and we'll, we'll hook you up with the fire, all right? Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. thanks for having thanks. us. Thanks, Fire. Hey, uh, Keep Joe, up the good work. Joe, when you're listening, we also got you a theme song. Here it is, baby. Everybody have an excellent week. God bless the United States.